Okay, if you all uh, mute your microphones, we are about to start our class. Well, welcome to our interfaith explorations of spiritual literacy, our Wednesday noon sessions. My name is Sophia Saeed. I'm your host and your moderator and the organizer for these classes. I'm also the executive director of the Interfaith Center, who is the sponsor of these classes, and our mission is to reduce the fear and hatred among world religions. So in this fall session, as you all probably already know, we are talking about spiritual literacy and we are learning about spiritual alphabets. We have uh, talked about, for example, G for um, grace, R for reverence. Last time we spoke about L for love and B for being present. And we had quite a powerful session. And I want to remind you all that if you have missed a session and you want to look at it again, please go to our YouTube channel and you will find all the recordings there. So all these spiritual alphabets are actually focused on those qualities of heart and mind that transcend all world religions. And whether you call them soul traits or um, heart and mind qualities or spiritual values, they help us connect with the divine presence and learn from divine wisdom. So today, the letter that we are going to do is V and V for vision. So before we start our session, we are going to briefly see a short video, a music video uh, about vision. And I hope that as we see the video and as we talk, listen to our guest speaker, uh, we reflect on the spiritual practice of vision, which requires us um, and actually allows us the discovery of fresh insights about how the things are in present. But then the practice of spiritual vision also helps us cultivate different outlooks about how the things can be in future. It helps us find our own wisdom and it helps us align ourselves with the spirit. So with that, let's listen to this small uh, piece of music. And right after that, we will start our um, session. So I'm going to actually share my screen. And since today I am the moderator and the technical person. I hope I'm able to do it. Okay, with that, we'll move on to our guest speaker and we have a special guest speaker today. 
uh, Reverend Susan Sim Smith, who's um, short bio I sent to you all. Susan has served as a psychotherapist for 25 years. And right after that, she became an Episcopal priest and worked as an Episcopal priest for the last 20 years and continues to serve as a priest and much more. She is a visionary and a spiritual visionary to me and to many, many others. Susan has helped start two nonprofits in Arkansas, but many more programs and initiatives around the world. And I have seen myself people come to Susan and ask her that this is what I want to do. Can you help me do that? And I am one of those people actually. And she's always there to make that fresh start happen. Those who know Susan, they know that she listens to the divine um, call through her meditation and her dreams. And those who know me, they know that I have a spiritual practice in which I connect with the divine through my meditation. And I try to listen to the call of divine through my meditation. And then I'm supposed to submit, submit unconditionally. And I learned that submission to the divine vision from Susan. So she has been a spiritual teacher to me too. So with that said, I would invite Susan to um, take the spotlight and teach us. Here you go, Susan. Susan, can you hear us? Yes, are you ready, Sophia? Yes. Okay, so you. I wanna start by reading two short pieces of scripture. The first one is from the book of Proverbs, where there is no vision, the people perish. Where there is no vision, the people perish. And one from Revelation, come up here and I will show you things which must take place. So in the spiritual practice that I'm doing right now, it's really important that I do not acquire any merit. So everything that Sophia just said about me, as I'm sitting here doing my spiritual practice, I am washing away any merit that Sophia gave to me because it's not good for me spiritually. And I am reminding myself of the real truth which is that God is the doer. That I think in this moment that I, Susan, sitting here talking to you, what I really know is that the divine is the doer. I am a, a little tiny conduit that sometimes gets it right and sometimes gets it wrong in terms of vision. But the real doer, the real visionary is the divine. And you already have had experiences with this in your own life. When you've been inspired by somebody and they've lifted you to a higher vision, maybe you've been inspired by a piece of scripture or a piece of music or talk or seeing someone on the street that needs help and you're inspired with a vision of a way to respond. So I believe that before we are born, that the divine already plants in each one of us, in each one of you, the service that we are gonna be doing on this earth. And then God wires us, wires has wired each of you with a wiring that enables you to have the vision of the service that is yours to do and the capacities to be able to do that service. So each of you has already had your own experiences with having been inspired, had a vision and given service to humanity. And later when we have our Q&A, we'll, hopefully you'll share some of those experiences as well as we can talk about questions and confusions because it's not always totally clear. So what I would like to do, to, the next thing is, I'd like to tell you a few stories about vision in my own life. And I, I wanna say that each one of us, as I already said, is wired with a capacity for vision. And then of the spiritual gifts, 
we each have more in some categories than others. We are not equally loaded with vision. We all have the capacity and we all need to use it. We're not equally loaded with compassion, although we all need to develop it. We're not equally loaded with capacity for silence, although we all need it. We're not equally loaded with the spiritual gift of reciprocity and so forth and so on. So when I start telling you these stories, I am overly loaded on vision. Now that is not always a blessing because it causes some uh, challenges for me and challenges for the people that live with me. And uh, it's, it's gonna all sound beautiful when I start telling it, but I will just promise you it has its woolly side and uh, I make mistakes because I've had so many success with my vision. I have to be very careful that I don't get overly confident because I still get it wrong. So as I tell the stories, it's going to just sound so gorgeous. But if you talk to my husband and some other people that love me, it has a bumpy woolly side too, which I'm happy to answer questions about later. Okay, so I, I want to start with a time when I became conscious. Probably vision has always been there in all of us, but when I became really conscious that God was doing something very different with me. So about 27 or eight years ago, my husband and I and our young daughter lived in a house in Hillcrest in Little Rock, Arkansas. And I began to look at other houses, blah, blah, blah. And I found a house and talked my husband into it and we made an offer on it. And uh, during that time, we, the offer was contingent on us selling our house. During that time, I had two or three months worth of dreams, like 52 or 46 dreams about a totally different place to live. And because I was trained in Jungian psychology, I did not take those dreams as anything literal because all my training was that it was symbolic. So I would dream night after night after night that I was living by a river with big bluffs. And so I would say to myself, I'm living close to the waters of the unconscious and I'm living close to nature. And the dreams just continued and continued about living by a river with big bluffs. And they went on and on and on until eventually one night, I dreamt the downstairs floor plan of a house. And I drew it in, the, in my dream journal. And it was a house where everybody would have a private space, but everybody would have a big open space to come together. And it had windows all on one side that looked out on this river. And I showed this to my husband. I said, this is really the house I would like to live in. He said, well, it's nothing like the house you're trying to buy. So I go to talk to the realtor and she says, you're not gonna live in that house unless you build it. And you cannot build unless you go way out in West Little Rock. And I said, well, my soul is kind of in Hillcrest. It must be a metaphor. So I went back and worked on it as a metaphor. The night before we were supposed to close on this other house, I had a dream that there was a new subdivision in Little Rock, not very far from Hillcrest, on the banks of the Arkansas River. And I said to my husband, is there really? He said, yes. So we go there and stand, and I see the view that I've been seeing in all these dreams. So my husband says we can't afford the lot, which we couldn't. Uh, we can't really afford to build a house you're talking about, which we couldn't. And I, I went to talk to uh, a realtor and anyway to make a long story short spirit already knew that a family member was going to pass away unexpectedly and leave a modest inheritance not enough of inheritance to everybody stops working and stays home and files her fingernails but enough of an inheritance that it made up exactly the difference between what we could afford and couldn't afford we had no consciousness this person was not supposed to die so anyway, that opened the door. We made the offer on the lot. I sat down with an architect, and he was through, and I said, we can't do this unless I can tell you 46 dreams. And we drew the house from the dreams. And the house has been an incredible, and is an incredible place to live, and also a place for the community. The house has been used for countless fundraising events, for on. It's been used for love and community and music and fellowship. And after I'd been in the house a number of years, I had a dream one night. 
and I heard, let this be a turning point forever in your relationship with God. When God came to you and told you to do something that didn't make sense to anybody else, my husband said, there are no children down there. There are no trees. There are only old people. We're not old. There are only rich people. We're not rich. There are only conservative people. We're not conservative. It made no sense to any of our friends or to my husband. But once we did it, it became an incredible, incredible force field of love and beauty and nature in our life. So the later dream was, let this be a turning point, a permanent hinge, when the divine comes to you and tells you to do something that doesn't make any sense and that you believe you can't pull it off. Let this, let this be a change in your whole life. So now I want to shift to, this has happened to me too many times for us to be able to tell during this program, but let me tell you the next big one. A few years after that, okay, so I was a private practice psychotherapist, and I had a beautiful office, wonderful colleagues, gorgeous furniture in my office. It was elegant, quiet. I was well paid. I did not have a boss. I usually had a two or three month waiting list. I adored what I was doing. I was doing couples work and lots of dream work and dream groups and I was happy and it was fun. And I began to dream at night that I was going to become an Episcopal priest. And I could not stand the dreams. I was not happy about it. I was not interested in it. I didn't feel called to it. The, the, the first dreams started, I kept dreaming about this dog. It was a puppy and it was like really, really healthy. And I would dream night after night after night about sheepdog puppies. Anyway, I did kept doing all this research and I learned that sometimes, you know, most of you already know this, but symbols and dreams are not concretized. Like a sheepdog doesn't always mean X. But I came to see that the sheepdog puppy that kept showing up in my dreams was connected to Christ and the, the sheep, the sheep dogs try to get the sheep close to the shepherd, close to the divine. So I had numerous dreams about that. Then I had dreams that I was going to go to seminary. I'd already been once just for the heck of it for a year, but I had dreams that I was going to seminary. I had dreams about chalices. I had dreams about silver patents. It just went on and on and on until eventually one night, this is the final, I knew I was being called to, uh, I knew I was being called to ordination, but I wasn't interested. Uh, a couple of kind of violent dreams that I had, I had a dream that there were teenage hoodlums that came into my psychotherapy office and they were driving me out, but I wouldn't go. And then the next night I had a dream that thugs with M16 came in and they were gonna like violently get me out of the office. So eventually the final dream that I had that was a turning point where I thought I am being reassigned and I better get with the program is I had a dream in which my husband's grandmother, a woman that I adored, who was already deceased came to me and she said, you have three choices. She said, you can stay at home and be a doctor's wife. And then the other one is she shows me this huge steamer traveling trunk. And she says, or you can travel the world because I love to travel. Or she says, you can take this. And she holds up a little sterling silver plate in the Christian church. It's called a patent. And you can take this little sterling silver plate and serve the bread of Christ. And in the dream, I say, I'm taking that plate. And I realize that I've been called, I've been given the vision of what I'm supposed to do for months. But now I've decided I'm gonna, as Sophia said, I'm gonna surrender to it. So going from God calling you to becoming a priest is, some of you already know this, this is, you don't just wake up, they don't all kiss your feet and call you blessed, I will promise you. And no, not everybody agrees and your family doesn't agree and your clients don't agree. I had people that call me up and fussed at me and said they're not enough people doing couples work, you're letting the community down, you're going down the wrong road. 
I had all my own resistances. I did not want a boss because I hadn't had one in years. I didn't want a male boss. I did not want to wear a stiff collar. I did not want to work in an institution. I did not want to be poorly paid, which I knew I would be. I really didn't want to work with a team or a staff. I was having a blast. If I wanted to sponsor workshops and bring in national speakers, I had total freedom. I didn't want in a system. I didn't want in a patriarchal system, on and on. But at the deepest level, I absolutely knew that it was like the house that I was being told to do something that God was the doer and I was to get that vision and go with it. So it's too long of a story to tell all of the opportunities to serve that ordination has given me. And they were all things that the divine already knew, all the things that had my name on it that would have been very difficult to do as a private practice psychotherapist. Not that that's not an equally fabulous ministry, but I had other assignments assignments that I didn't know anything about. So becoming a priest has been not unlike the house. There were hidden blessings in every obstacle, like how am I have a, like a 12 year old daughter and a husband that works at the medical school. How am I gonna go to seminary? Where am I gonna find the money? How's this gonna happen? It, it all worked out. It wasn't smooth, it wasn't easy. It wasn't always fun. But, and, and there were terrible challenges in the beginning of being a priest. There were issues, there were people to deal with, there were situations, but the overall arc of the divine being the doer and each of us being servants was validated once again. So by this time, I'm kind of getting the hang of this process. I don't, I don't take it for granted granted but i'm getting the hang that okay sometimes you're asked to do things that sound really unusual so somewhere along in there after i'd been ordained maybe seven or eight years i started working with a group of people to help start the arkansas house of prayer and that vision did not come out of dreams or meditation it came just more out of i saw a photo of this gorgeous round building I knew architecture could really help people learn to meditate. I wished we could have it in Little Rock. It didn't come from any like phantasmagoria of meditation. And it also seemed like something more normal that would work, not, not some of these far out kind of visions. So that's a different kind of vision. It's more pedestrian is not the right word, but it's more every day. So there's a picture of the Arkansas House of Prayer, which most of you have seen. So I'm, I'm going to tell two or three more visions. I'm going to stop. I want to make sure and save 15 or 20 minutes for us to talk. So I'm going to tell them until we run out of time. So the, the next one, let's see. Sophia, what year did we start? I think I helped start working on the Interfaith Center about 10 years ago. Is that about right? Roughly? Unmute yourself, sweetie. It was the winter of 2011. That, that work actually started? Yeah. Okay. So February, I think it was February of 2010. This is what happened to me. Now, this one is weird, but it was also wonderful. I had been told in a whole series of dreams that I was supposed to go to this particular monastery in India. And it's really hard to get there. And there are all these complications. You have to get a legal permit. It's very close to the border of China. Uh, it's not even a very safe place to go and getting up there wasn't very safe and getting back wasn't very safe, blah, blah, blah. I did it and I ended up in this unbelievable monastery and I had my whole meditation life changed there, which would be another story, which we won't go through right now. But one, it was also very cold there and the room that I was staying in had only like a little space heater, but the electricity was off. 80% of the time, and the only way there was any heat was occasionally the electricity would come on. It was a really unusual situation. The room had two holes in the walls where the electrical wire went to the outside, and you can see the sleet coming down. It was, it was challenging. 
So the way that I would fix it so that I could take a shower in the morning is I knew the heat usually came on around nine. I, mean, I knew the electricity usually came on around nine. So I would put my clothes out, my hair dryer out, my shampoo out and the heater out so that if the heat came on, I could run in there, get a shower and get my clothes on. So this was another night where it was sleeting and I woke up about 3.30 in the morning. A voice said to me, wake up and pray and your whole life is gonna change. I, my first thought was my poor husband, poor, poor Rick Smith. How that is not going to be good news to him. Whatever it is, he is not going to jump up and call me blessed for this. So a friend had told me before I left that she had heard that she was supposed to loan me a ruby necklace that I was supposed to take on the trip. I was not happy about that either because I was terrified of losing it, but I had taken it. And this voice in the night said, hold the ruby necklace as you pray. Well, ruby is sometimes a symbol for the consciousness of the divine. So I get up and I have on a wool stocking cap. I have on long underwear, pajamas, a fleece jacket and another coat and all kinds of things to keep my feet warm. And I sit up, I can hear the sleet coming down because there's a hole in the wall. And I sit up and start meditating from probably 3.30 until 5.30. And so I just go on and on and on, trying to get more deeply into the silence. And the experiences in the monastery were allowing that silence to be deeper and deeper. So eventually I got deeply, deeply into the silence. And I heard a voice that said, evil has gone into all of the world's religions. It has infiltrated them. And it is pirating some people out of each of the religions and it's teaching them to hate and fear each other. We want you to start an inner, I heard Interfaith Institute. We want you to start an Interfaith Institute to help reduce the hatred and the fear among the world's religions. And I said to myself, I absolutely do not want to start anything else. I'm getting older, I thought I might retire. I'm wore out and tore up, which I really wasn't. But I was like, no, done, finished. No more giving birth to things. Giving birth to the house of prayer was huge. And so I, I was kind of saying back like, you know, I don't even know anything about interfaith. Like, why would you want me to do this? I'm not interested. What do you see in me? I'm not, I don't even have any interfaith friends. I'm, I'm a good liberal, so I love other religions, but I don't know anything about this and I don't want to. So I kept hearing, we need you to do this. And eventually I heard, what were you planning on doing with the rest of your life anyway? It was like spirit said, do you have any better alternative for spending your time? If so, show up and tell us what you're planning to do that's better than what we're telling you to do. Then I realized, okay, whatever this means, I've got to go with it. It's not another one in a series. And, it, and I also heard, you need to go talk to Chris Keller. So it took me a couple of months after I got home from this trip to recover from some things that happened on the trip and to be willing to think about a new project. But eventually I did go talk to Chris Keller, who's an, what is an Episcopal priest. And at that time, he was head of a program out at St. Margaret's and uh, it was called the Institute for Theological Studies. And he said, I cannot believe you're coming to talk to me. The Institute has four goals, blah, da, da. And the last one is interfaith. And I have had no time, no energy, no staff, nobody to work on it. Why don't you start whatever you're going to start through the in existing Institute, call it a center and let's see what happens. And I said, Chris, I'm not great on technology and making flyers. If you'll find $10,000 for me to have an administrative assistant, I'll do it. So he found the money. I hired an amazing administrative assistant, Sarah Catherine Gutierrez, and we started trying to learn what is going on in the interfaith community, what organizations are already there, how could we offer some initial programming. And uh, at some interfaith event, I, we were, I was attending things and trying to get the lay of the land and get some education. 
And I was at an interfaith dinner and somebody introduced me to Sophia Saeed. And we start talking and I had just learned the word in Islam called dhikr, which Sophia's probably already, already taught you about, but it's how to have a personal relationship with God through meditation and dreams and other, other spiritual practices. And I said to Sophia, who I'd never met, I said, I just learned that Muslims are interested in dreams and meditation. I never knew that. And she said, oh, I always, my thing is to meditate, especially before I go to sleep, because I'm really interested in listening to God through my dreams. So I had two thoughts. My first thought was how ignorant I was. And my second thought was, I have just met my spiritual sister in Islam. And that has turned out to be true in this friendship that has changed my life, my friendship with Sophia. So then Sarah Catherine and I said, well, let's do a, a beginning program. Why don't we have people from all the religions teach about meditation? And so we created a program called Let's Pray. And well, we had met, I'd met Sophia, so she could be the person to teach meditation from Islam. And she said to me, I don't ever teach about my private spiritual practice. I've never done it. I don't even know if I could do it. I'm not interested. Of course, she said yes, and she did an unbelievable, maybe an even more beautiful job because she was so humble about whether she could do it or not. And that was the first program that the Interfaith Center had. Uh, different people from different faiths taught meditation. And we had 92 people that showed up for the first event, just out of the blue. So after that, Sophia became our main volunteer to help things happen. And then it just grew and grew and grew. Well, Sophia was already doing Interfaith work on her own. And then Sophia is really the one that has brought the Interfaith Center into fruition okay so there's that story i have about six more minutes so I, i'm going to tell another one one i'm not going to tell but i'll say for some other time when i'm with some of you all i was guided by a series of dreams to go to india for the first time 10 years ago and it has been the most significant life-changing experiences of anything in my whole life i've been 18 times in in 10 years. That's a lot of trips to India. And they've just been incredible. So I'm going to put that in a little box because that's too long of a story to tell. And I'm just going to tell a little a shorter story. So through a long series of synchronicities, I met a man whose name is Kutumla. And he's the official oracle of the of Tibet. And he serves the Dalai Lama and he lives in Dharamsala. And he has a monastery with 56 monks that pray for the protection of the world. And it's a long story about how I met him, and it's not relevant. But anyway, the first time that I met him, I realized that he was a person of deep spirituality. So I had my iPad, and I would show him a photo of the beautiful house of prayer. And when he saw it, he lit up like a Christmas tree. And he, he, spoke, he said to his translator, go get the architectural drawings. And he sends the translator into the next room and brings in this huge architectural rolled up thing. And he says to the translator, spirit has called me to build an interfaith, round interfaith meditation center for the people of Mongolia. Now he lives in India, but he goes to Mongolia and ministers to the Buddhists there. And I'm supposed to do this. And he, the drawings were just, I mean, they would just take your breath away. They were so gorgeous. And I say to him very naively and kind of ridiculously, when you get ready to build that, if there's anything I can do to help you, I'll be so happy to help. So fast forward three years, I end up with a crack and a bone in my hip and I'm told to stay home for six weeks. And I used that six weeks, tremendous, like four hours a day of meditation. And during that time, of course, the divine had uh, happily participated into the minor crack in my hip, which again, totally healed uh, with no surgery or anything. But during all that silence, I kept seeing Kutumla. I kept seeing the building. And eventually I kept hearing over and over 
cover, you are supposed to offer to help him, not really even knowing what I could do to help him. So I get my daughter, who's great on the computer, to help me craft to send something to him. I decided I would invite him to Arkansas to come visit our house of prayer and let him look at it and see what in the world might spirit be stirring up between a Christian priest in Little Rock, Arkansas, a high level Buddhist monk in India about building something for people in Mongolia. So you, a quick history of Mongolia, you might remember that thousands of Buddhist monks were murdered during communist regimes and almost all the Buddhist monasteries were destroyed. And there, there are Jews there, there are Christians there, there are Muslims there, but it's almost all, it's like 93, 95% Buddhist with a minority of other religions. But religious freedom there is very new. And almost everybody that lives there can tell you somebody in their family that was murdered for having faith. So anyway, he comes to Arkansas, he does programs, he stays at my house, he brings a bunch, a bunch of monks, and I have a meeting with him with the monks, and I say, you know, I'm not sure how I can help you, but Spirit is really calling me to offer. And he said, God has already told me to do this building, and you're, first, you're standing behind me, putting it back on my radar screen and showing me that it is important. And he said, I'm going to get refocused on it. And I said, well, what, this was like October of a few years ago. I said, what can I do to help? He said, come to Mongolia next summer. They're having a 60th birthday party for me. There'll be events every day. Meet the Buddhist people. Look at the land. Look at their need. See what is needed. Uh, let them get to know you. Show them pictures. There's Kutunla. Show them photos of what is already happening in Arkansas. Uh, there are young children in Mongolia that need to meet people of other faiths and they need a place of silence and spirit is calling this work to be done. Just come go with me and let's see what happens. So just to kind of wrap this up to a, a certain place. So I am now involved as are some of you on this phone call in helping raise the money and create the reality. The divine is the doer. We are little conduits for plans that the divine has. So there's a round interfaith place for silence in Little Rock. There's a round one in Southern India in Auroville where I go. And someday there's going to be a round one in all of all places in Mongolia. Why? Because the divine has reasons for round interfaith buildings of silence. And the divine has made a decision to give birth to the divine's vision.